Hey, it's Nathan, and today I wanted to go ahead and talk about these things, which are computed-aided approximations of Julia sets. And in order to explain how you could go about doing something similar and implementing a similar algorithm, I'm going to go ahead and talk about these things. In particular, well, how do you make a Julia set? What is the Julia set construction? And then next, what is the escape time algorithm that I used to make some of those pictures? So in order to do that, we're going to have to go ahead and just talk about what a Julia set is. So a Julia set is generated by repeatedly applying a polynomial function of the complex plane. That is, in particular, given a polynomial function with degree greater than one from the complex plane to the complex plane, the filled Julia set big F sub our function denotes the set of complex numbers such that the following is true. Now this is a little bit of weird function notation here. Uh, that just denotes the number of iterates of F applied to Z. So we're making sure that as N approaches infinity, the composition of the function N times does not go off to infinity as well. And so once we have found the filled Julia set, we can just use the boundary operator to look at the boundary of that filled Julia set to yield the Julia set of our function. So at least mathematically, there's not a lot of pushing of mathematical logic that's going on here. Instead, what we're doing is we've just given a definition for an object that we would like to visualize. In order to visualize that though, we're gonna have to take that definition and translate it into a piece of code that can help us think about these things in a visual way. So since we're just interested in building visualizations of Julia sets, we again just need to understand how to translate this mathematical definition into a viable algorithm. Now I want to stress that the way that we've defined Julia sets so far means that we could produce an algorithm that could work for any general polynomial. But for the purposes of this video and for the purposes of explaining what an escape time algorithm looks like, at least one version of one, the one that I wrote for this video, uh, we're going to stick to polynomials of the form z to the n plus c, where c is a complex number that is given by the user. So the first thing to notice when you're going about building an algorithm for a definition like this is that we're not going to actually be able to produce this thing exactly within a mathematically efficient amount of time. So the only thing we can really do is check representatives from small regions of the complex plane and then decide on the entirety of that region accordingly. And so with that, we've actually gone ahead and identified all of the inputs that I had for my escape time algorithm. I haven't really organized them in a really nice way, so I'm going to do that now. So first off, we're going to go ahead and need the degree of our polynomial, which will be little n. Next, we'll need our complex constant of interest, which will be our c. Next, we need a way to break up the complex plane into these smaller regions where we can take representative elements. To do this, we're just going to use a square w by h grid, where w is just width and h is just height. When we translate this into code later on, uh, this just means that we'll have a width of w pixels and a height of h pixels in our image. And each one of those pixels will correspond to some box region in the complex plane. And we'll do a representative check on that region of the complex plane by using our last input, which is our big N, which is how many times we'll want to iterate before we give up and decide if a point escapes or not. Another way to put this is that we're going to go ahead and look at the set of iterates from one to big N of the function on a complex point, which is just going to be one of the representatives from one of our regions in our grid. And that's a subset of the full sequence. And so that big N will tell us what subset of checking is good enough. So the first major question that you probably have about this is, well, we have this grid that we want to put down in the complex plane, but we haven't figured out where we want to go ahead and put it. It turns out that whatever complex constant that we choose in the case of 
polynomials of f of z equals z to the n plus c, which are the ones that we're considering for the purposes of this video, we can actually get that region that we want to put the grid on from the complex constant. So in order to get some intuition behind that, I'm going to go ahead and do the n equals 2 example because it's pretty straightforward in terms of the inequalities that are running around. So if we go ahead and look at the complex numbers that are greater than this expression for our given complex number of interest, c, then when we go ahead and apply our polynomial, which in this special case is going to be z squared plus c, then we can see that the function applied to any complex number that fits that condition is actually going to be farther away from the origin than the original number that we had before we plugged it into the function. And so that tells us the radius around the origin that we need to check. Since we're going ahead and breaking up our region into squares and not sectors of concentric circles, is that the right is that the right word? So anyway, since we're since we're breaking it up in terms of boxes instead of those sector things, we're going to go ahead and use that radius to define a box. And so our grid would then be used to cut up the region defined by negative r to r cross negative r to r, where r is that 0.5 plus the square root of 1 fourth plus the absolute value of our complex number of interest c. So now that we have an idea of what each input is going to be used for, and we've talked through sort of like what the Julia set construction is mathematically, we can go ahead and ditch the chalkboard and look at the code that I've written. Disclaimer, there are probably more efficient ways to do this. In fact, I know there are more efficient ways to do this. However, the code that I've written, I feel, reflects the mathematical framework that I just spent the first half to three quarters. I actually don't know how long this is going to be in editing, but, you know, around the first half of this video explaining, uh, and that is why I'm talking about this piece of code that I've written. So I'm just going to talk about what I did. There are some cooler things out there. Yeah. So this first bit here, we're going to go ahead and define how big we want our image to be in pixels by a width and height variable. Next, we go ahead and define how many times we're going to iterate the function before we give up and say that it did not escape. All three of these variables are input by the user. We then ask the user to define our function using a power and a complex constant. The complex constant is then used to determine the square region that we are going to cut up with pixels. Now, right before we make any calculations, we go ahead and make a blank image that is our width by our height in pixels, and then load those into a variable, which I call pix, so that we can change the color later on after we have gone through the computation. Lastly, we go ahead and read through each column of pixels. At each pixel, we go ahead and look at this zpq variable, which tells us which pixel we are at based on the column and row index of the pixel and the radius from earlier. Then we do some escape checks until the iterate of the point has escaped outside that radius, or we just give up because we hit our big N iterate number and say that the point made it into the Julia set. While we're doing this, we keep track of the iterate, and then when we stop, we use whatever iterate we stopped on to define the color that we're going to make that particular pixel. Since these are while loops, we'll go through and repeat this process for each pixel in our grid. And then with a little bit of file magic, you get images like this. So yeah, that is how you can make a Julia set while sticking pretty close to the mathematical framework for its definition in fractal geometry. Uh, that's basically all I have for you today. I hope this was something that you enjoyed or found interesting. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, I know my thing was that I had seen all of these images of Julia sets, but I never like took the time to code an escape algorithm to generate them for myself. I don't know, I enjoyed it. Uh, if you enjoyed it too, you can give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more math stuff. Uh, also, you know, you can leave me a comment if you have any suggestions for things that I should talk about in the future, math-wise or otherwise. And yeah, that's about it. Uh, as always, uh, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.